Well, I say amen to that. I think that I like that version uh, just as well or better than Old Lang Syne, the uh, normal song. So that was really good. And it is to lift up the Lord, isn't it? That's what New Year's are about. Uh, it is great to see you this morning. It always is. And Happy New Year to you, in case I don't see you in the next couple of days. I uh, hope you have a great festive uh, transition to a new season of life and ministry. Um, we are in a series here, and this morning I'll be talking to you a little bit about opening your spiritual gift. And uh, I take it probably you've o- opened all of your, your gifts already. Uh, at least I hope you have. If you haven't, maybe you'll do it today. Um, and maybe even you've opened gifts that you decided you needed to take back. Anybody in that category? Maybe you got a gift you got to take back. I've been trying to get the quirks to smile at me when I take something back. And they just talk about the unblinking cosmic stare last week. That's kind of what I'm getting. <laughs> they don't like to take the merchandise back. Not too enthusiastic about that. So... Uh, but anyway, hopefully it's all worked out and you have no problems. And, uh, but if you do, it, uh, sometimes we do have to kind of exchange gifts and things. Uh, we're talking about opening our spiritual gifts. And it, again, it fits right into uh, thematically, it fits right into the series where we've been. Uh, we're in Kaleidoscope, seeing life shortcuts differently. It's a series in 1 Corinthians. I think we started this like in 1999 or something. It just seems like, seems like we've been on this forever, but it's a 16 chapter book. So we have to commit to long term study. A lot of the larger churches and things won't, they only four to six weeks on studies and then they're off to something, something else. So I think it kind of plays to our ADHD kind of generation, but we've got to stay with these books and really to fully, to dig into them and, and unpack them and understand and apply them. Then we grow deeper. And we're able to uh, uh, reach farther and uh, grow taller in our faith. And as well as to have a pretty good understanding of why this book is such a special book. It, that is the Bible. So, and every book in the Bible, it's actually an anthology of books, 66 books. And we take them one by one. And I don't know how many we've done here, but this is one of many. So thank you for staying with this series. If uh, you find yourself falling asleep ever... In the worship service here, uh, just know that the messages are online in video and audio form. So if you do go to sleep and you wake up and you hear me say something like, man, I wish I was listening. Just don't worry. Don't fear. You can go out there uh, by Wednesday, usually the same week, and you can access that message. So you'll be fine. Um, and if, if by chance you're new and you've not been here at the beginning of the series, then I just would say, you know, these messages will be up there for a long, long time. So you can go back and kind of backlog and fill in where you've missed. Okay. Um, But I guess if I were to uh, summarize and uh, simply state without a lot of details what I want to say today on this last Sunday of 2013... And as we think about transitioning to a new year, 2014, I would just say to you, don't be too big for small things. Don't be too big for small things. And if I could state it maybe a little differently, do small things with great love. Do small things with great love. Uh, the Corinthian environment was a multicultural one. They were blessed, that is the Corinthian believers were blessed with people who had different spiritual gifts. And this made for dynamic small group meetings and ministry. They would typically meet in little apartment house churches, maybe four to six people. And when Paul writes about spiritual gifts in, in the book of 1 Corinthians, it's imperative that you look at it from that standpoint. I don't know that Paul was envisioning churches of 300 or 400 or 500 and seeing, uh, seeing how the gifts would be used in those larger contexts. I think he pictures it and envisions it in small group house church settings where three to four, five, six people, maybe eight to ten people at the max 
would come together periodically throughout a week. They would come together. Each one would bring something to the, to, to the meeting. So it was very participant-centered. One of our core values here, they would participate, involve themselves. Everyone would bring something, and then they would uh, grow through that and learn from that, and they would discover their spiritual gifts together, and they would go on to be a ministry. And then occasionally, once a week, maybe even once a month, they would come together in large group. And in large group, they would have love feast. They would all the little small groups would come together, kind of like we are today, in one of the larger homes within the fellowship of believers. And then they would share together and they would have a little longer meeting on those Sundays that they would get together the first day of the week. And then they would uh, engage in some of the spiritual gifts and things, but with a few of the spiritual gifts being more predominant in those larger group settings, such as we have here. And so... This was a multicultural Corinthian environment with Greeks, Romans, with uh, former pagans, with uh, Jewish people, people with uh, a very conservative Jewish, Judaistic background. They were coming together. They had Christ in common. They were meeting together in these house churches, coming together periodically for large group meetings. And they would meet together, discover gifts, use gifts, and they would deploy that, uh, the body into the community to do God's work in the world. And a problem, as you've come to realize, there are many problems in Corinth. One of the problems was that this had morphed into something that was not God-honoring. And instead of letting all the gifts be used to uh, bless the body, there was a favoritism shown towards certain of the gifts. So if you had certain gifts, you were actually elevated in your status. And those gifts were, were seemingly given priority. And so Paul has to write in such a way that he addresses this issue such that all the gifts could be active in the body. And no one gift, especially the gifts that they were esteeming, wouldn't be pushed to the front, sensationalized, and thus relegate to the sidelines other important gifts. And so, uh, and just like Corinth... I would say you have a gift to open. You have a gift to discover. And what is a spiritual gift? Well, it, it's an area of enablement to serve the body of Christ. It's a spirit-given ability to those who believe, those who have received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit through a relationship with Christ. You are given an ability for service in the new community. And some of you may have never really thought about that before, but you have something to offer to this body of Christ. I often uh, say to myself when people share with me that, you know, I'm a a Christ-only Christian. I don't need the church and I don't need to be a part of a larger group on a regular basis. I can follow Christ without that. And so I, I say yes and yes, and I understand where you're coming from. And I would, I would just let me add a couple of things for you to think about. What about spiritual gifts? Do you yourself have all the spiritual gifts that can edify your family and your marriage and your, and your uh, people around you? Do you have all of them? And, the, and if you don't have all of them, wouldn't it stand to reason that maybe there's others who have gifts that you don't have that if, if you're never around those people to benefit from their gift, don't you think that might impede your spiritual progress a little bit? See, people who say, I don't need to go to church have a very small view of spiritual gifts. They don't see the importance of them. See, you have abilities that I need for me to grow spiritually. I need you, and you need me. My spiritual gift is that of teacher. And I've got all kinds of things related to that because I've kind of, the Lord has shown me over time as well as feedback from people. When I teach the Bible, people grow. They understand complex passages. It's very simple after I've delivered a, a teaching. Why is that? It's the Lord. It's not me. He's given me a gifting in this area. This is what I do. This is who I am. And just like I have a gifting, and then when I use that gift to bless you, the body, you grow through it. And when you use your gift, it grows me. It blesses the body again. And so this one blesses this one, and this one blesses. And we bless each other through the giftings that we have. And so you have a gift... And what Paul wants you to do is to open that gift. 
It's not just natural talent, although that's one way that God is creator. He blesses us with natural talent and ability. But you can have incredible natural talent. And unless Jesus is Lord of your life, you're not going to use that talent to edify the body. You might use it to make money. You might use it to, uh, you know, get a fan club. You might use it to, as a platform to do a lot of other things. But unless Christ is Lord, unless the Spirit lives in your life, that talent or ability is not going to be harnessed with the power that it could have if you would surrender it to the Lord. So you have an ability. You have a Spirit-given ability. You have at least one. Some of you may have a gift mix. We could think in terms of plurality here. Some of you may do many things well. But you have this unique Spirit given, I'm going to say Trinitarian given, because you'll see it in a second, a Trinitarian given ability to be a blessing to the body of Christ. So we don't, you don't just need the church, the church needs you. We need you here, and we need you opening your gift, and you don't have to return these things, okay? They're good, they fit you. They're a little bit about who you are and the way the Lord has made you. And so, per the message a couple of weeks ago, we learned that the Corinthians, they had these incredible spiritual gifts, even clear back to the beginning, back, like I said, back in 1999 when we started this series, okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 7, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, clear to back at the front of this letter to this messed up group of Christ followers. We read that Paul affirms them, you don't lack any spiritual gift. As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. All of the gifts we need at Stones Hill Community Church, they're here, they're resident. The question is, have we opened them? You have all the spiritual gifts you need to be a dynamic, powerful body of Christ. And the point is that we must open these gifts... Be alerted to these gifts. Be aware of these gifts. And then when we choose to exercise these gifts, make sure that we use 1 Corinthians 13 as our guide. So that any time I use my gifts, it is from a motive of love. Okay? So you have a gift. And you have all that you need to be dynamic in Christ. Some gifts are more prominent maybe than others. Some are more visible than others. But all gifts are important. And unfortunately, like I said, the Corinthians had kind of gotten out of balance in this area of their life. And so if we look on slide number four, on 1 Corinthians 12, and uh, we read these words, now about, peri day, now about or now concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Paul uses the now about phrase, like five, six, seven times in this letter when he's transitioning to a new topic. Transitions to a new topic. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, or we could say more literally, the, now about the spiritualities. Now about the spiritualities, brothers and sisters. Okay? I do not want you to be uninformed. You're my family, man. You're my bro. You're my sister. Right? Right? We're going to grow together in Corinth. We're going to do some good stuff in this church, in the community. And you guys are, uh, have all the talent and ability you need. We're brothers. We're sisters. We're not going to be uninformed. We're going to make sure that we're aware of how the Lord works through people. And he says, you know, verse 2, that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. All right. In the new community, by contrast, there are words, not idols that don't speak, but we're little Christ. We're little representatives of the Lord, and the Lord speaks, and he speaks through you and through me and through our giftings. And so these mute idols who said nothing are contrasted here with the words that are offered, the God-inspired words that are offered in the new community. And Paul says there's lots of good words, lots of good services and deeds that are done. The Lord uses that to speak. Therefore, verse 3, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? Well, not everybody that we're showing up at these... uh, 
uh, small group meetings and lar- even large group settings were actually uh, sold out Christ followers. Some were not. In fact, some were rebellious Jewish uh, former, or perhaps they were still Jewish in their thinking and, and Jewish background of Judaism, and they just couldn't conceive how God could ever show up as a baby in a manger. They just could not buy that, and so they resisted, and they, you know, Jesus be cursed. He's just like any other criminal that died on a cross via a Roman execution stake. Nothing, bit, no big deal about Jesus, okay? And Paul says there's a few like that. And he also says there are those, though, who say Jesus is Lord, and those three words were the earliest words used in a confession, a simple creedal statement in early Christianity. And this is proven by a, lot of, a number of different scholars. But Jesus is Lord was a power-packed, confessional, creedal thing to say. And it's still, in, it's still the right thing to say. It's still the right thing to believe. Jesus is Lord. Uh, And so Paul sets up up front here, uh, make sure that you love the gift giver more than you love your gift. See, we can love our gift, and we want our gift to be on display sometimes, like the Corinthians. But Paul says, I want you to make sure you get this right. Jesus is Lord, and his lordship shows in a lot of different ways in how you live your life, especially how you use your spiritual gift. All right? So Jesus is Lord, and I would just say to you this morning, that's a confession you need to personally apply in your life, especially as you're looking to launch into a new year. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Because if he's not Lord of your life, not only will spiritual gifts not work right, your whole life won't work right. And Paul has to, you know, he has to write three chapters. In fact, one gift in particular, the prayer language or tongue-speaking gift, and I'll deal with that next week in more detail but that was so problematic in Corinth he has to write a whole chapter on how to use it because they were messing it up and so uh, you know it's easy to get this messed up but it's not just the gifting we mess up we mess up everything when Jesus is not Lord when he's not king and ruler over all of our lives and so uh, when we make this confession, Jesus is Lord, it is by the Spirit, and Christ is not a dumb idol. He speaks to the body through the gifts, and so contributing to the body life of the church, it is for everyone, not just an elite few. It's for you and for me, for everybody, because you have a gift to unwrap, a gift to discover. Uh, slide 5, verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts. But the same Spirit distributes them. I want you to think Trinity here, okay, for the next three verses. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the Lord Jesus working through service. The Spirit working through the giftings. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and everyone... And in everyone, it is the same God at work. So there's spirit, there's son, there's father, there's Trinitarian presence. It's a dance. And when you get in rhythm with that Trinitarian dance of father, son, and spirit, and and he spins out these various gifts through you, these acts of service, these small things done with great love, Paul's like, that's just as important as some of these other sensational gifts that you Corinthians think everybody needs to have. So he's trying to bring clarity to a, to a viewpoint that's gotten off uh, balance. It's off center. And so the source of the gifts has these Trinitarian overtones. And so what I would say to you, the only way you'll ever discover and be able to unwrap your gift, of course, Jesus is Lord. That's the, you've got to start there. But then as you start there and you get in rhythm and fellowship with Father, Son, and Spirit, and you begin to grow in your faith, and you begin to attend small groups, and people start noticing stuff about you, or they start noticing stuff about what happens in your life in large group settings and what you're doing for the body, all of a sudden, you don't need a spiritual gift test to figure out what it is you're good at. You see it. The body sees it. They affirm it, and you're able to grow in that gift. Not that there's anything wrong with spiritual uh, gift tests, and there's a lot of those. 
But I think that what Paul's vision was, don't take a test and figure this out. No, no. Paul's vision is make Jesus Lord, partner with the local church, do small group. And in that small group, all the gifts will be present and active and and break out among the body. And you'll have ministry happening in those small group settings. And then occasionally you come together for a large group for uh, the bulk of the teaching. And then you, uh, and and prophecy and other gifts. And we'll talk about that next week. And then you distribute it back out to your small groups and to uh, continue the ministry of the church and the body. They were messing this up. Okay? And so Paul is intent on broadening the Corinthians' understanding of spiritual gifts. And he wants to broaden it in such a way that they include humbler forms of expression such as everyday acts of service. Don't be too big for small things. Don't, uh, positively stated, do small things with great love. Well, pastor, I, I'm not dynamic. I don't have all the gifts that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and, and, and Ephesians 4. I, I just don't, I don't know that I'm pegged on any of those things. And Paul's like, well, can you love? 1 Corinthians 13, can you love? Start there. And not only can you love, but are you willing to do small things with great love? Or, or are you too big for small things? Verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's not that I can demand attention for my gift. It's not that I demand my gift be central to everybody else's gift. No, 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 no. What he says, the common good. That my gift surrendered to the qualifications of 1 Corinthians 13 love when it's Christ is Lord I discover my gift I use my gift I open that gift among the body I do it with 1 Corinthians 13 as my filter the common good happens isn't that beautiful and Paul gives a sampling of the gift slide 6 verse 8 to one there is given the spirit through the spirit a message of wisdom. Wisdom. That is, some people have unique insights that help resolve conflict. They're just good at it. And if you're never around people with the gift of wisdom, how are you going to know how to get relational insights, ethical insights, moral insights, doctrinal insights? There's a lot of doctrinal, uh, uh, messy diapers in the, the doctrinal world, okay? We're just crapping all over ourselves doctrinally these days because we don't know the Bible and we make all of these doctrinal messes because we don't understand what's here. You need somebody with the gift of wisdom who can sort through that stuff. Someone with a relational wisdom that can help you know what to do in your next step in your troubled relationship. Guys, you can't do life alone. You can't, you can't, you can do it alone, but you're going to be, what's going to happen if you don't deploy your gift and if other people aren't able to deploy their gift in your life because you're never a part of anything? Whether it's a small group or large group setting or other, or, or, you know, allowing the gifts of others to impact you. Okay? So this is an invitation to do community life. It's an invitation to open up something, to, to make Jesus the center of it. And, and, and we need wisdom. We need wisdom in our life sometimes. And In fact, uh, this is not a comprehensive list, by the way. This is just a sampling. There are many other gifts. They're mentioned in other places. And I'm not so sure that Paul ever gives us an exhaustive list. He just gives samplings of this is what happens in the body. These are definitely the ones that are at work, but there may be others. And, and, and we get that from verses 4 through 6. There's these grace gifts. There's distribution of services and distributions of workings. In fact, he's like, I, I can't name them all. There's so many. And so, but wisdom is definitely a prominent one. And he says, to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. And there are those like teachers who have insights into God's intentions that stand behind a text in the Bible. What I'm doing right now is a spiritually energized thing. It comes from the Lord. I don't know why I think the way I do. I don't know why. It's just that it's his energy working in me. I got to define terms. 
I got to understand verses and phrases. I got to break it down. I've got to realize what it was meant in the original context so that I can explain it today and apply it to your life. It's God's energy in me. You see it every week. It's his grace gift through me to you. And you have gifts just that work just like that. Gifts that flow through you to others. It may not be here behind a table on a stage, but you're just as important in the body. And you have this knowledge. Some have this knowledge. They, they understand God's intentions and, and they're and they very careful with the text and they bring it out in a very easily understood manner. That's the gift of a teacher. What are some other? Well, verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Some have this extraordinary confidence in God to act. They just know God is going to, he's going to intervene in powerful ways. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. All right? Some are healing agents in people's lives. Gifts is in the plural here. It's not the gift of healing. It's gifts, plural, and I'm glad no one was sitting on the front row because you just got spit on right there. Okay? <clears throat> just, uh, you're playing it safe here on the second row. You're in a good spot. All right? But gifts are plural here, meaning what? Well, it means that we need healing on multiple levels sometimes. And I can see at least three levels. We need restoration and healing. There's physical healing. There's some that just pray and they, and they trust God and they have that gift of just trusting the Lord for physical healing and lay hands on you and pray for you and faith, believing God to intervene. There are some that do that really well. There are some who aid in social and relational healing. They just are soothing presence in broken relationships. There are some who give psychological healing. There are some who stand... Uh, to give you spiritual healing. They just guide you along the spiritual birth canal and, and they just birth you into a new life. Don't picture that too much, all right? But they birth you into a new life and you're, there's spiritual healing. Guys, we need healed on multiple levels. And Paul says there's gifts, plural, of healing. And we need it unwrapped in the body. To another you know, thinking about that, there was a woman in my church growing up, and she was known as like the wart remover lady. And I don't know why, but the Lord had gifted her. If you had warts, she would, <laughs> isn't that funny? She would take and she would just rub those warts with her, with her hands. And a few days, they'd, they'd drop off. You know, I kind of wish there was like a mole removal gift in here in the body. I don't know. Something about when you turn your mid-40s or something, moles and things start popping out everywhere. It's like, God, what? help me here. Help me here. You know, what's this about? What are you trying to get through to me here? Well, maybe there's somebody with the gift of mole removal in the body, okay? I don't know. But uh, it's, we can't, this is not comprehensive list. This is just like a sampling. We don't know all that God might do in and through you. But when you make Jesus Lord and you start unwrapping this stuff and you start growing in a Trinitarian dance, God does amazing things in and through your life. Can you imagine like going to small group meeting with all the gifts like present? You wouldn't want to miss it. I'm not missing that for anything because God shows up. People's warts fall off and I mean, come on. Can you imagine how excited this Corinthian fellowship was. Can you see how Paul is so jealous for it? And when it starts getting out of balance, he corrects it because he doesn't want people to mess it up. You see, this large group is not meant for a lot of small group functions. A lot of the gifts aren't designed to work in a setting like this. They're designed to work in small group ministry. And so I'm going to be plugging small group ministry. That's big. You want to be a part of it. Because I see it as a primary stage in which the gifts happen and occur. Okay, But to another, miraculous powers, the energy of God works through them to accomplish great things beyond just healing. Okay, there's the miraculous stuff. I have seen people healed. It's miracles. I mean, I have. I've, I've witnessed it. Uh, people prayed for others, and the doctors just shake their head like, I don't understand this. This shouldn't be the, the MRIs don't show this. Or they showed this one MRI ago, and now it's this. 
I don't understand that. Okay? Uh, and, but it's just beyond the healing, though. There's miraculous things. Uh, Geneva prayed a tornado away from her house when she was uh, back in her uh, earthly sojourn years. Okay? And, uh, and God gives, gives people this way. Uh, and not only that, but to another, there's prophecy. There are some that confront evil in love. All these gifts should be done in love. And they declare God's will to the people and they call for repentance. That's just, this is part of my spiritual gift mix. If you notice, I don't sugarcoat things sometimes. I'll just shoot as straight as I can shoot, but trusting always to do it in love. And letting the teaching gift draw out the truth, the prophetic part of it, saying, okay, now, come on. Let's, let's confront our issues. Let's modify our worldview because if we keep doing this stuff, this is what we can expect. So there's a little bit of that going on, I think, in the spiritual gift mix God has given me here. But prophets, they love to, uh, you know, call us to account sometimes. And we need that in the body. And sometimes prophets bring up an application of maybe what's currently going on in current events. And they bring an application from the Bible that applies to that event. And so when that starts happening, you've got to be grounded with the, the gifts of a teacher. Because if you're not grounded, you can get into never, never land on some of that stuff. Okay? But when you're grounded in the Word with the gift of teacher at the helm, okay, making sure that we stay rock solid on the truth... There are those prophetic words that God can give. Uh, things that maybe we haven't even studied or prepared for, but it's a, it's a word from the Lord. And when, he, and when we get those, then it's important that we have another with distinguishing between the spirits, verse 10, because uh, you need somebody that can say, well, you know, that guy's teaching and preaching is right on. Pay attention. Or, or that is the work of the enemy. And we are in spiritual warfare here with stuff going on behind the scenes. So you've got to have distinguishing spirits, right? You've got to be able to have an eye for the truth. Some have an eye for the truth. And we need to listen. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. All right? It's a language inspired by the Spirit. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, it was a human language that was being spoken. And they all heard like 16 different languages were spoken by people who didn't know those languages. But they spoke those languages and they, they heard the gospel in their language. So that's one aspect of it. But it also expands out here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 into a kind of prayer language. So, so it's, it is a different kinds, plural, of tongues, plural. So it, it's not just a miracle of language, speaking languages that you, you have not learned. Or it's not even just the gift of learn, to learn languages quickly. It's more than that. And we'll have to address that then uh, next week when I talk uh, more specifically out of 1 Corinthians 14. And, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. It's a, it's a hearing of the message of God through the prayer language. And so again, Paul gives a sampling and he says, all these are the work of the one in the same spirit, slide seven. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. We don't have to pray, God, I want this gift. No, no, it's more God, show me the gift I already have. You distribute to each one just as you determine. You know how you've gifted me. You know what's, what operates in my life in spirit-powered energy you take over. You help me to see it. I'm not necessarily going to choose one and say, that's going to be the one I have. No, I'm going to let you show it to me in the body. Okay, so now as we back away from this a little bit, and we look at what we've just read, we have to look at, this is a listing, of course, I think we got that, but we have to compare it with the other list that we've already seen in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, so when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, Paul presents an ascending list. The ascending list indicates he starts at the bottom and he works his way up. And when he does it that way, with each gift, there is the potential of greater glory for the individual. And so what he does in the case of the Corinthians... He wants to modify a viewpoint that's messed up. They've elevated this idea of, of a prayer language gift. And so Paul puts it at the bottom of an ascending list in 1 Corinthians 13. 
He puts it at the bottom of a descending list in 1 Corinthians 12. Okay? Why does he do this? Is he picking on the prayer language people? No. He's correcting a viewpoint. They've elevated that gift to a position and a place in the body it should have never been. And he's saying, come on, rein this in, guys. This is not edifying for the common good, the body of Christ. Okay? So he starts at the bottom, and he says, you know, if I speak in great prayer languages or tongues and I don't have love, I'm nothing. And then he ups it, he ups it a tick in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. He ups it a tick and says, you know, if you thought prayer language was great, what about prophetic utterances? And if you think that's great, what about faith to move mountains? And if you think that's great, what about martyrdom and sacrificing everything? But here in 1 Corinthians 12, it's a descending list. And so Paul, again, is reigning this in. And the, and the Corinthians had elevated this one particular gift to such a level because evidently a lot of status was conferred on those who used this prayer language gift that Paul intentionally places it last in these ascending and descending lists just so you can get the point. He wants to correct a viewpoint. And I would come back to my, my uh, words in beginning this message My point is, don't be too big for small things. They were too big for small things in Corinth. They didn't think that doing little things with great love mattered. And it does. Well, as we continue through this, uh, if you'll go, uh, we're going to skip a few verses and hop to 27 of chapter 12. He says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it and God has placed in the church first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Okay, he gives a first, a second, a third and then after that he he clusters things up in a loose priority. He just stops the numbering. And so he seems to be saying, when you come together, especially in your large group, Body of Christ sessions, make sure there's apostles. Make sure there are those, those that have, uh, of course, you, it's kind of logical too. You have to have those who plant churches before you can have a church. And so apostles were those who planted churches and they, they came in the authority of ascending body. Second, prophets. Once you've got a, a planted church, an established church, you've got to have those who will confront the world views of the people. Those who will challenge people to go deeper and they give these deeper perceptive insights into what's going on around us. So once you have a church, you need prophets. And once you have prophets that work in the body, you also need teachers. Thirdly, teachers who unpack the truth, who, who uh, pry open what is obscure in the Bible, who, who unravel what is knotted up and what is tightly packed. And then uh, slide seven, once you see uh, these gifts at work in the body in a way that builds up the group, then you need, uh, having taught the people, you need those, especially those who meet in small groups who can facilitate miracles. Slide seven. Uh, the gifts of healing. How do you exercise the gift of healing if you don't know who, he, who needs healed? How do you get to know who needs healed, small group? You meet with a group of other Christians on a regular basis and you get to know them a little bit and you begin to use your gift in that clustering of believers. Right? So you're planted, you're confronted with your worldview, you're taught, and now there's miracles and there's healings and there's helping. People can just jump in and get stuff done. Uh, There's guidance. Those with the gift of leadership, they can lead through problems. They know how to solve problems. And there's a a different kinds of tongues. And then he says, slide 8, verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? And the answer is a rhetorical and clearly and a plain no. No, no one can do all the work of the church. We need each other's gifts, and that is the point he's making. And he says, now you, the congregation, eagerly eagerly desire 
the greater gifts. What's he saying? Eagerly desire all the other gifts. In other words, open up your life to these gifts. Don't just say, I'm not talented and I can't do anything to help anybody. No, no. Open up your life to how the Lord might be calling you and using you and bringing together your spiritual gift mix to bless the body. And he says, I'll show you a more excellent way. And what is that excellent way? Well, go to slide 11. Slide 11. We talked about the excellent way already. And it's right here. Well, pastor, I'm not really flashy and I can't rub warts off of people and, and uh, I can't, uh, you know, I, I can't teach and uh, prophecy. I mean, what's that? And uh, tongue speaking, well, that's definitely out. And so, you know, we go through this little mental list like I can't do any of this stuff. I'm not, I'm not like on the first A team of God here in the body. And Paul's like, you know what? Would you do me a favor? Will you start with what you know? Can you love somebody? Can you do small things with great love? Or are you too big to do small things? Are you too proud to accept the God-assigned role that God has given you? Okay? And so when you look at this, and just keep that in front of the people here for a little bit, guys. And you look at this, and you, and you see uh, what was going on. And if I contextualize this in the Corinthian context, you know, what we're going to see is that you had guys, uh, Paul's like, you know, when wealthy patrons patiently, patiently, love is patient, when they would wait for a lowly dock worker slave to arrive at the love feast, that was worship. It's just as important as a prayer language or uh, a prophetic utterance or uh, whatever other gift you want to would want to name. But that's worship too. And, and, and uh, when a wife showed respect and kindness to her cheating husband by still wearing a culturally sensitive head covering, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, when she used her gift at church, that was worship. That was Kindness. And when a sensational teacher in Corinth offered a, a masterpiece sermon and all the other teachers in the body did not envy him. It does not envy. And when someone else, you know, it's not about me today and my gift. In fact, it's more about my pride and my boasting. No, not today. I'm going to keep quiet today. Because this is the Lord's moment through them, and I'm not going to mess that up. That was worship. Or when the pagan prostitutes stepped away from the gyrating pagan worship atmosphere where their bodies were contorted and they were twerked in all kinds of suggestive Miley Cyrus positions, okay? When they came to the fellowship gathering of Corinth with those shaved heads and those gyrating pagan utterance experiences they were having in pagan temple and instead they came and in a prayer language they offer a word from the Lord instead of that ecstatic idle utterance and they did so with modesty it was honoring to others not dishonoring and their sexual overtones in the greek word used translated honor they did it in such a god honoring way not something that would just sell themselves in the worship gathering yeah. And uh, when someone shared with the leader, if I have this to offer, but only when you feel, you know, I do have something to offer here, uh, but, but only when you feel the time is right, because I don't want to see, I, I don't want it to be something that is self-seeking. Are you with me? Do you see, we've, again, we've got to take the halo off of 1 Corinthians 13. Stop just using it at weddings and funerals. And use it in everyday life. Whether it's worship, a team, work, family, wherever you may be. Yes. Amen. 
And, 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 uh, and when someone confronted these Corinthians on their priorities, maybe the teacher or the prophet stands up and boldly proclaims in Phil Robertson fashion that maybe something isn't right about the way we view a, a certain issue that's hot in our day. He kind of looks like a prophet, doesn't he? Hang with me because I'm going to illustrate from his life. Oh, you guys didn't know it was Phil Robertson Beard Day, right? Okay. Some of you on the front row can see that, right? Or I should say the second, safe second, spitless second row. When someone confronted them on a viewpoint, on a priority, which is what church is about. If you never have anybody digging around you ever and you come and hear the same themes over and over and how good God is and how great you are and how you've got it all together, you're never going to grow. Somebody's got to call you on things. And the prophet does that. And the teacher can do that as they expository teach the word in a loving way. And when someone confronted the Corinthians on their priorities and on their habits and on their routines... And they had, instead of an attitude of rebellion and resistance, they had an attitude of learning and obedience. And that's what Paul wanted them to have. But some of them didn't have the attitude. And so he has to say, it is not easily angered. That's love. When someone shared with the group about some great life hurt that was inflicted on them by, by another careless person, but they rise up in the little small group setting and they say with a resolve in light of God's grace, I will keep no record of wrong. That's worship. It doesn't have to be the sensational gift of prophetic or of apostolic or prayer language or, or uh, these other gifts. It doesn't have to be any of those things, friends. This is how it starts. Are you loving in everything you do. This is the beginning of opening up a life of giftedness and blessing. And when someone says, I will keep no record of wrong, I don't know about you, but that's a message that will preach. That's a life that impact. that's the person I want to hang with. Because if I don't, everybody else that keeps record of wrong, I'll offend everybody. Nobody will like me, right? You got you to hang with these people because they understand Grace. And they're not looking to peg you on all the things you're doing wrong in your life. You see how dynamic the body of Christ can be and should be? When love is the center, and from that, it's Christ as Lord is the creed, and from there, it, 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 wave, it, it waves out, ripples out, okay, into these wonderful giftings, okay? And when someone said in Corinth, you know what, I don't know, all of the details may be about this situation, but I know Jesus is at work in that person's life, in her life. Jesus is at work in her life. And you can say and do whatever you you feel compelled to say and do about her. But I will protect. I will trust. Because they are committed to the truth. And quite possibly someone might come to Christ if we just persevere in love and hope. If you'll just give it time, you'll see love come through and we'll all go through the process. That was worship and that's where it starts. Small things with great love. We don't need this entertain me mentality that was going on in Corinth. We don't need that. Christ is Lord is sensational enough. And when people live a Christ is Lord lifestyle, and that spills out in testimony and sharing, that's enough. We don't need to sensationalize that. When people are owning stuff and they're breaking free and they have attitudes, old attitudes being replaced with love, You don't need to sensationalize this stuff like the Corinthians were doing and actually rating these gifts on the basis of preferability and messing the whole thing up. You see, given all these gifts 
things about spiritual gifts hastening on here and the power and energy at work in the fellowship of believer, why in the world would you ever choose to do life alone? Can you imagine this dimension being brought to your life? This added dimension of miracle and healing and faith and apostolic power and Bible-centered dynamic teaching. Can you imagine doing life without any of this? You might be struggling with a health crisis and find healing. You might be trying to make a decision and get direction from a wise person at church just in time uh, when you're facing this huge decision and that person with the gift of wisdom gave you just what you needed to make that decision. You might be discouraged and think you can't make it and you find faith to move a mountain or maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's just a simple resolve to get out of bed tomorrow morning, warts and all, and try again. Some family member might be in a moral fog and some prophet comes along and gives them a good swift kick in the behind in a loving way and it wakes them up and they get clarity because some prophet had an insight. You might be struggling with a biblical question and some gifted pastor teacher just unpacks it and breaks it down and you walk out of here, that's clear as day to me. How did I never see it before? You can't miss church and be okay in the long run. It's going to impact you. You can't check out a community. You can't check out a small group. You can't check out a spiritual gift opening and and using and deploying these gifts without it having ramifications in your life and the lives of other people. You might feel lonely and ashamed and full of regret. But someone at church showed you unconditional love for the first time. A 1 Corinthians 13 love. Some mature, grown-up, Christ-following radical that says, I'm going to love even when it's not popular to love. And they lead you to God's forgiveness, and it changed your life. Sometimes an act of love and grace can set someone free to do the right thing the next time around. And you experienced it when you came to church. This is, you can start here. Don't go for the sensational. Open your life up and start in 1 Corinthians 13. Work out from there. Get informed on the gifts. That's what this is about. Be open. Your gift may be different from what you prefer. Be available. Serve in many ways in the body of Christ. But by all means, be thinking about deploying, discovering and deploying a gift that God has given you. Be sensitive. Listen to the feedback of others. And I will say this now. Get in a small group. We're revamping those. We're recasting vision for those. And boy, I tell you, a small group working with all the gifts, man, it's, it's, it's going to be a powerful thing. I need to wrap it up here this morning. And I want to do so by pointing out someone who I think has the spiritual gift of prophecy. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it by now. A guy by the name of Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty fame, right? Like I said, someone loaned me the book and I I read through it a little bit over the Christmas break. And uh, he definitely is filled with God's love. He's also a prophet. And he even looks like one. You know, he just got the look. And uh, I don't know how long it took him to grow his beard that long, but some people think maybe years. But hey, that's, I mean, you got to admit, that's a man looking beard, right? He's got it going on. He's a prophet. You can just see this guy giving a thus saith the Lord or holding the Ten Commandments on Sinai. I mean, he's just got that look. He also has that spirit. And, uh, and he's so likable, though. He's, he's, a, he's a guy you, you would love if you just get to know him through the book. I've never watched one episode of Duck Dynasty. Not the first one, okay? So I haven't seen that, but I have read some in the book, and I've seen some interviews and things. Very powerful story. The guy was married. He's been married like 50-plus years. He got married. He and his wife got married at 16 and 15 years of age, respectively. Uh, he's like an outdoorsman guy. He's a, he's a guy from times past. Uh, we could even say, you know, he's from primitive Louisiana town, and we could say he's probably, uh, he's probably the closest thing to a West Virginian you're ever going to get. All right? He went to Louisiana Tech. There's nothing like an educated hillbilly. Man, they can do some damage. Okay? He went to Louisiana Tech to play football on a scholarship, and 
he wasn't doing so well in his classes. And so uh, this prophet of God uh, said he'd rather catch fish anyway. So he caught fish. He'd give them to his instructors, and that improved his grades in college. Okay? And uh, he said his plan was to hunt and fish full time and get a college education while doing that. That was his goal. Football was secondary to ducks and a lot of other things. And uh, so he started for Louisiana Tech. In fact, it's interesting, on page 62 of this book, uh, he, he, I'll just pick it up. L- just listen to what he shares. Uh, Despite football not being my primary interest, I still had a decent career at Louisiana Tech. He said, I played quarterback for the Bulldogs from 1965 to 1967, and I was the starter in 1966, and I threw for like 300 yards against Southern Louisiana University. It's one of my highlight games. He said, during preseason camp the next year, I looked up and I saw a flock of geese flying over the practice field, and I thought to myself, what am I doing out here? I walked off the practice field, and I never went back. This guy's an outdoorsman. He's a hunter, okay? The coaches came to me uh, to my apartment the next morning, and they found me cleaning a deer in my kitchen. Yeah, he says, it ain't season, I told him, so I had to bring the meat inside, all right? No matter how hard they tried, the coaches couldn't persuade me to come back. The quarterback behind me on the depth chart was a guy named Terry Bradshaw, who was a lot more serious about football than I was. Terry started the next three seasons at Louisiana Tech and was the number one pick in the 1970 NFL Draft. He became the first quarterback to win four Super Bowl championships with the Pittsburgh Steelers and was selected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I still tell Terry that if I had never left, he wouldn't have won four Super Bowl rings. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? See, God had other plans. We see quarterbacks, God sees prophets. Flipping over later in the book, listen now. You're going to see a a, a live video footage of this in just a second, but just to prepare you for it. He says, for the first 28 years of my life, I didn't know the gospel. I didn't know Jesus. And now I'm trying to make up for lost time. Jesus said all the authority was given to him, and he told us to go preach the gospel, make disciples of all the people we baptized. And basically, Jesus is telling me to go forward and share with people what I didn't know until I was saved. I've been, I've been sharing everything I've learned since I was converted. And nowadays, I get asked to speak at churches, colleges, hunting clubs, other groups around the country. The Almighty has put me on the road, but some of my best work still occurs on the, on the river right in front of our house. And he goes on to tell a story. He's going to tell that story uh, on the video in just a second. But God, we see quarterbacks. God sees prophets. We need the prophets in our life. And, and after he got into, uh, after he left the Louisiana Tech football team, he got into all kinds of trouble. But he became a Christ follower, and it changed everything. Settle in for the next eight or nine minutes here and watch this guy's story unfold. Play the, play the clip, guys. We all go six feet deep in the ground. I think now they're digging them about four and a half feet to save money. But we all end up in a casket. And people wipe their eyes. Because we're gone. It's called fact. You saw where I grew up. The time period would have been in the 1950s, but if you saw it, you would have thought it was 1850. Log house, milk cow, plow horse. No bathtub, no commode, like Coca-Cola, this little, none none of that, no. I never heard anyone say we were poor, not once. 
No one ever said, man, we are really up against it here. I wonder why somebody doesn't bail us out. <laughs> no. I ran up on Miss Kay when she was 14. There's an old saying in the South. If you marry them when they're about 15 or 16, they'll pick your ducks. If you wait till they get to be 20, they'll pick your pocket. So Miss Kay and I married early. Bill started school and we were so poor. So in love, but so poor. Baby on the way. Actually, Alan was born, I was 17 years old and Phil was 18 years old. So we were basically two kids with a kid. But you have to grow up and you do. That's what you do. Now when I got to college, I was on my way to being a bone to be chewed, as they say. I started seeing the change in Phil, and this really came when he started spending a lot of time with the football team. Parties in college, you know. It was the 60s. Y'all remember the 60s, don't you? What I saw was Phil, who had never drank before, started drinking. And what happened with me was it was scary to me. Jason was born, so thrilled about another boy. Phil was happier than ever. Unfortunately, the drinking got worse. He would be mad and just be in and out like a flash. And I knew then, but I didn't want to believe it, was running around on me. Probably smoking dope, other things, pills he took, things like that. It was just all new to me, the whole thing. I owned a beer joint when some guy came in with a Bible and he wanted to introduce me to Jesus. I ran him away. I said, get out of here. I'd take another drink. Then we have our new baby. Willie Jess. So there I was, a barmaid who doesn't drink and had three little boys. I've been fighting for this marriage for a long time and it's not working. But what went on next was horrible. It was like the nightmare of my life. I got in a big bar room brawl. The laws got after me. I went to the woods, of course. And, um, uh, he it out. Phil came to me and said, I probably won't surface for two or three months. Do the best you can with what's left here. And he was gone. He became more and more mean and mean-spirited. And what I would tell my boys all the time is, that's not your daddy. That's the devil in your daddy. I would say the low point it's when I ran Miss Kay and the kids off. You're all alone, no hope, miserable. That's when I began to serious contemplate, is there a way out of all this? So I came to Miss Kay and she said, you know the guy that came up there to the beer joint that time and wanted to talk with you? I said, yeah. And you ran him off? I said, yeah. Why don't you sit down with him and, and just see what he has to say? So I sat down with this guy. He said, Phil, what do you think the gospel is? And I said, I don't know, gospel music on the radio or something like that. He said, you don't even know what it is. I said, I don't guess I do. I didn't even know what the gospel of Jesus was. So when he went through, Jesus coming down in flesh through a little virgin girl, Mary, dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead. I'm like, how in the world did I ever miss that?
I had missed it. I was blown away when I heard that Jesus died for me, was buried and raised from the dead. Something so, it is simple but profound. That happened back there almost 2,000 years ago. I had never heard it. When we came back home, I think there was a note that said they had gone to the church building. So we headed in there, and when we got into the auditorium, I just stopped because there he was up in the baptistry with a man. And the boys all stopped, and they were on each side of me. And I remember just looking at them, and he was, I heard Phil say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to follow him from this day forward. And I looked down at each one of the boys, tears were rolling down their eyes. Even three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old Willie Jess, big tears were coming down. And the next thing I knew, he was baptized. And I come up, and the boys started hollering and singing, jumping all over the place. And they said, my daddy, my daddy saved, my daddy saved, my daddy saved. They were so happy. And it was the... It was the complete family then. I said, I'm fixing to hang another gear, and I'm turning from my sinful past, and I am fixing to make a valiant attempt to be good. I said, I've never tried it before. I told the guy when he studied with me, he said, just love God and love your neighbor and try to be good. I'm like, I've never tried that before. He said, can you try? I said, I can try. See, you got rednecks, then you have river rats. So I'm reading over in Romans chapter 12, be good to your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, do not return evil for evil. The river rats tend to be far better thieves then you're just local rednecks. You be good to them and don't return evil for evil. I was fishing for a living. It's my livelihood. I'm working my tail off. They're hungry, feed them. These river rats would would steal my fish. I'd caught several of them before then. Usually I'd just come up, roar out there, come up with my shotgun and say, the next person who moves dies. They're stealing my fish here, Lord. They're hungry feet. And you want me to do what? Do not return evil for evil. Well, I have to see if that will work, but it makes no earthly sense, that's for sure. So one day I heard a motor slow down. These guys pull over to my to my float and I'm watching them through the bushes. So I said, I'm going to be good to them, but I'm carrying my gun just in case. They're not good to me. And I'm going to do what the Lord said. I'm going to be good to them. So I roar up on them, and they're getting my net almost up in their boat, and they look up and they see this guy coming. They be me, wide open. I said, what were you boys doing with that net? And they said, oh, is that what that was? I said, yeah, that'd be a hook net. It belongs to me. I said, here's the good news. I'm going to raise the net, and whatever's in there, I'm going to give them to you. And when I said that, they looked at each other, and they said, they left me looking back, and all of a sudden, up and down the river, they quit stealing my fish. I just gave them what they were trying to steal. I took that to mean... God was right all along. The first year in sales, I had turned to God. First year sales, duck commander, 8,000 bucks. I said, Miss Kate, we are rolling. She said, we are going to starve to death. I said, no, we're not going to starve. We'll be all right. This is Alan, Jason, Willie, and Jeff. 
they all run the company and their wives. So one of them told me the other day, he said, Dad, you remember when you started out with that $8,000 worth of duck calls? I said, yep. They said, this year we're going to sell close to a million duck calls. It was either dog luck, but I am giving the credit to God Almighty in heaven for the duck call sales, the fish that were in the nets way back, for my life. I'm giving the credit to the Almighty, and we shall see at the end how it turns out. I feel pretty good about it. Everything I do, this is what I talk about. They'll tell me to give a speech on something else, but guess what? It always comes back to this. We all go six feet deep in the ground. The grave is a problem. So is sin. Jesus came down in flesh and saw both of them. So for me, my household, I just think that uh, we would all be better off if we loved God and loved each other. At the end of the day, you will be happy, happy, happy. My name is Phil Robertson. My name is Miss Kay. My name is Jet Robertson. My name is Reed Robertson, and I'm second. See, in the South, we don't say second. We say second. Like it's a T on it. Second. Know second. what I'm saying? Second. This morning, as our conclusion, do you need to proclaim Jesus is Lord, Christ is Lord. Man, what a great way to start a new year. In fact, on the count of three, if the whole congregation could just say, Christ is Lord, and if that's something you want to happen in your life, just say it with everybody else. Okay? Ready? One, two, three. Christ is Lord. Say it again. Christ is Lord. One more time. Christ is Lord. There is no better conclusion. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Discover your gift. Put it to use. Thank you.